It's the timeless story of girl meets boy, girl and boy fall in love, girl wants to be with boy, but boy is from a planet that only exists in our universe for two weeks at a time every 60 years, girl decides to stay on planet with boy, but it turns out she can't, girl goes home, and boy disappears. And I'm sorry, but I'm just so tired of that formula. This is a review of the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, Meridian. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know why everyone's pretending that Dax is leaving, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. A not-so-great episode that nevertheless holds a special place in my heart. What do I mean? Just give me a minute and I'll tell you. Before we get to the main story of the episode, we need to get the B-plot started, so here are Kira and Odo hanging out, minding their own business when this weirdo walks up, and I can confidently say he's a weirdo before he even says or does anything, because he's played by Jeffrey Combs. And I know what you're gonna say. This is Jeffrey Combs' first Star Trek role. How do I know the guy is a weirdo just because he's played by Jeffrey Combs? Because I've seen Reanimator, okay? I'm feeling a very tense energy between us, is it me? Anyway, this guy is Tehran, and he's got the hots for Kira, and Kira is not remotely into him, so she's like, hey man, you just caught me having coffee and hanging out with Odo here, who is my lover. We're in an exclusive relationship where we fuck a lot, so... Tehran's like, I get it, he's a shapeshifter, he can make his penis any size or configuration you want, I can't possibly compete with that, I'll leave you to your breakfast beverage. We'll come back to Tehran in a bit. Meanwhile, the Defiant is on the other side of the wormhole, and Cisco's like, Commander's Log, star date 11 Tjillion point two. I've convinced Starfleet that we should continue to explore the Gamma Quadrant, even though the people that live here and control a lot of this territory have explicitly told us not to. They detect some unusual readings from a star without any planets around it, and then there are some cartoon stink lines in space, and then, poof, there's a planet! Neat! Right? It's not a scary thing, it's a cool thing. Neat is the appropriate response. Neat! This lady, Sultan, calls up from the planet and says, Hi, space people who randomly happened to be here at the exact moment our planet appeared. You probably have a lot of questions about this whole deal, and I'd be happy to provide exposition if you wanted to join us for breakfast. So Cisco, Dax, O'Brien, and Bashir beam down to the planet, which is called Meridian. There are only about 30 people who live here, and one of them is this guy, Dural, and he is super into Dax right away. They're sitting together at breakfast, and he immediately asks Dax about her trill spots. How far down do they go? And Dax says, all the way. Across the table from them, O'Brien's sitting there like, I've worked with her for three years, and I never asked how far down the spots go. Cisco turns to Selton like, so you were saying something before about exposition? Selton says, yeah, so what it is is our planet exists in two universes, this one and another one, where we have a totally non-corporeal way of being, and we live as pure consciousness. We phase into this universe for a couple of weeks, and then we phase into the other universe for 60 years, and then when we phase back into this universe, it's like no time has passed. Everything is exactly the way it was last time. We don't age in the other universe, only in this much shittier one. Dural, who has a brain to go with that pretty face of his, adds that he has a theory about what causes Meridian to shift between universes. I think it has something to do with fluctuations in our planet's quantum matrix, which are somehow triggered by our sun when it... Hold on a second. I've got to feed Dax like a child to establish romantic chemistry. There we go. Back on Deep Space Nine, Tehran walks out of a hollow suite and approaches Quark, who is like, hey, that didn't take long. Did you jizz already? No, I did not jizz at all. Your hollow suite programs are far too prosaic to satisfy my lubricious sexual appetites. I demand that you make me a custom program. Quark's like, sure, what can I get you? I would like a realistic hologram of Major Kira that I can fuck. I have no ethical objection to that whatsoever, but creating a program like that will take some work, so it's gonna cost you. I can pay. I assume you accept graham crackers? 
Quirk gets to work on Tehran's hologram, the most challenging part of which is, how's he going to be able to scan Kira's image without her realizing it? At first, he tries to trick her into going into a holosuite by offering her a free session as a prize for being his bar's one millionth customer. But Kira's like, nah, no thanks. As everyone knows, holosuites are for creepy perverts like Tehran or fun change of pace episodes only, and she leaves. On The Defiant, Dax and Dural, in between flirting like teenagers, have developed a theory that the planet's shifting might be related to gamma ray bursts from the star. So they launch a probe to study the star, and while they wait for the probe to send back results, they beam down to Meridian and Dural takes Dax for a walk in the country. He suggests that they climb a tree together, which wins me over to his side instantly. Climbing trees is awesome and fun, and people of all ages who are able to should do it more often. Dural takes Dax by the hand and says, Baby, I want you to climb my tree. But Dax hesitates. She says to Dural, Before this goes any further, I want you to know that I've never done this before. Done what before? Climb a tree. Oh! Oh! Okay. What did you think I meant? Nothing. Did you think I meant, like, have sex? No, I just... Because I've done that before. Okay. I wasn't saying a lot. I really just want you to climb my tree in a literal, non-sexual way. So they do, and Dax isn't comfortable because she's scared of heights. Dural likes her, so he doesn't make fun of her for the fact that they're only like three feet off the ground. Instead, he helps her down, and they walk a little more, and then he's like, here, eat these berries I just dug out of a fucking lake. She does, and then they make out, and then they go back to the village and review the probe findings, and then Cisco calls to check up on them, and after they hang up, Cisco and O'Brien share a look like... Dax and that Dural guy are totally hooking up. Could they be any more obvious? Oh my god. After studying the telemetry from the probe in between off-screen sex acts, Dax and Dural figure out that Meridian's dimensional shifts are caused by fluctuations in the star's quantum fusion blah blah blah, and if the Defiant can stabilize those fluctuations, Meridian will be able to stay in this universe for longer, which is a good thing, because the people of Meridian, the Meridianites? Meridians? Meridian Indians? Want to be able to start families and shit, which is hard to do when you only experience the passage of time for two weeks at a stretch every 60 years. Meanwhile, back on Deep Space Nine, Quark is secretly recording Kira to acquire training data for the non-consensual AI porn he's been contracted to produce, and he gets caught because he's really bad at this, and Odo and Kira just see him doing it. Quark says he's making a simulation of station ops for his customers to enjoy, and he needs hollow images of all the senior officers. Kira's like, I don't think so. And if I ever catch you taking pictures of me again, I'm going to put that camera in your ass. And not the way you like it, the other way. Odo does some more investigating and finds that Quark has accessed classified personnel files to get information about Kira. Instead of arresting him, Kira says she has a better idea and asks for Odo's help, preparing a little surprise for Quark. <laughs> Over on the Meridian side of the episode, Dural and Dax are like, so totally in love, you guys. Dural tells Dax that he wants to build a house for them, but it will take time to make the changes to the star to stabilize Meridian's dimensional shifts, which means the next scheduled one will still happen in five days, and then the planet won't be back for 60 years. Dax is like, I mean, use your head. What's the fucking point? So Dural says, I'll leave Meridian and live in this universe with you. Dax says, okay. But then the next day or whenever, Dural comes back to her like, mm, I changed my mind. I don't want to leave. I want to stay. So Dax says, don't cry, you big baby. I already talked to Dr. Bashir and he can use the transporter to change my quantum whatever, whatever. So I can stay on Meridian with you. How would that be? Dural's all for that. So that's the plan. Dax is going to leave her whole life and everyone she knows behind so she can be with this guy she met like a week ago. Cisco and Dax have a touching farewell scene. They're going to miss each other, yada, yada, yada. Back on Deep Space Nine, Tehran shows up demanding his Kira porn. And Quark, unaware of the shenanigans Kira and Odo have been up to, sends Tehran in to inspect the program and presumably do some jizzing. But when Tehran walks in, he finds Kira's legs, Kira's torso, but topped off with Quark's head. Tehran is appalled. He stomps back out into the bar and right up to Quark. Did you jizz already? I didn't jizz at all. 
I will ruin you for this, Quark. You've jerked around the wrong jizz junkie, you injudicious jackass. I know a guy at the Ferengi Commerce Authority and a guy who works for the Dominion, and they can both make your life a living hell. I swear I will jizz in your face for this, rhetorically speaking, of course. And he leaves. And Kira and Odo are standing there watching, and Kira's like, ha ha, loser. Time for Dax to definitely leave forever. She says a final goodbye to Cisco, O'Brien, and Bashir beams down to the planet and is met by Dural, who's like, hey, look, I picked you some more berries from out of the fetid muck at the bottom of that leg. Num, num, num. The planet starts to shift, but something is wrong. The stink lines appear, but Meridian isn't vanishing smoothly like it's supposed to. O'Brien realizes that Dax is somehow disrupting the process, that she's acting like an anchor holding the entire planet in place. I guess altering her quantum whatever whatever with the transporter didn't work. They manage to beam her back to the Defiant just as the planet does finally disappear, moments before Dax is left floating in space. Later, Dax is in her cabin. Sisko drops by to let her know that after she was beamed away, Meridian shifted like normal. So it was you. You were the problem. You're the reason. It almost all went horribly wrong. Just thought you'd like to know. Anyway, I'll give you time to get over it, I guess. Sisko leaves, and Dax says... I'll only need 60 years or so. Aww, she miss him. Meridian pops up a lot on worst episode of Deep Space Nine lists, hence its inclusion in this batch of reviews, but I actually don't think it's that bad. Which is not to say I think it's a good episode, it's not, and I'll get into why in a second, but is it worst episode of the series level bad? Nah, I don't think so. It's very well acted. The regulars all do their usual solid job. Guest star Brett Cullen as Dural is fine in a tricky role, and Jeffrey Combs is perfect as Tehran, one of the sleaziest, most off-putting Star Trek characters ever. It's particularly well-directed. Jonathan Frakes helmed this one, and he does everything he can to elevate this material. I especially like the way he uses high camera angles during the tree-climbing scene to give the impression of height, even though it's obvious that their perch in the tree they've climbed isn't remotely high. And the Kira Quark Tehran B story though having nothing to do plot-wise and very little to do theme-wise with the A story, is entertaining and builds to a funny and memorably absurd payoff with the Kira with Quark's head hologram reveal. The biggest weaknesses in Meridian are Meridian itself and the Dax Dural romance. For a planet with such an exotic dual-dimensional existence, it's a pretty boring place other than the fact that they happen to live on this planet that does this unusual thing, there's nothing unique or interesting about the people. Dural seems nice, a little forward at first, going for the how far down do the spots go play right out of the gate, but Dax seems into it, so okay. But he doesn't have much in the way of personality. And for me, that's really the biggest problem with the episode. The emotional center of the story is the love story between Dax and Dural, and I just don't buy it for a second. Yes, it's rushed, but that's not the only issue. Hell, Romeo and Juliet is a rushed romance too, but that hasn't stopped it from becoming a classic. Even within the confines of the Star Trek franchise, we've seen single-episode insta-romances that have mostly worked. Captain Kirk and Edith Keeler in The City on the Edge of Forever, for instance. Sure, Kirk falling in love with Edith so hard, so fast, is a stretch, but for me at least, it works in the moment because Edith is not only beautiful and charming, but also presented as an extraordinary, visionary, potentially history-shaping person. Dural, on the other hand, is just some guy. He's nice. He seems like an okay dude. Dax certainly seems smitten with him, but do I believe she's willing to abandon the rest of her life to be with this guy? This guy? Not for a second. And if I'm not sold on that, I'm not sold on the episode. However, that does lead me to the reason why, as mediocre as the episode is, I have a special fondness for Meridian. That fondness comes from the scene where Sisko and Dax are saying their goodbyes. I've told this story in videos before, so I'll just skip to the point. This Cisco and Dax scene is the moment that crystallized for me why Deep Space Nine is my favorite Star Trek show, and beyond that, why I love most of the stories I love. Like I said, I don't believe the Dax Dural romance at all. I also don't believe Dax is really leaving the ship to stay on Meridian with Dural. 
When Cisco and Dax are saying goodbye, intellectually, I know the entire time that this isn't going to stick, that something is going to happen before this episode is over. And by the time the credits roll, Dax is going to be back on the ship and that planet will have shifted into the other dimension without her. I know this. I've known it from the first time I watched this episode. Dax leaving to be with Daral? Not happening. But do you know what I do believe? I believe Dax and Cisco. Even though I know that Dax isn't actually going anywhere, I believe that they believe she is. I believe that they think this is really goodbye. And most importantly of all, thanks to the way these characters have been established in the show up to this point, and the way this scene is written, and the pitch-perfect performances of Avery Brooks and Terry Farrell, I believe that these two people, Ben Sisko and Jadzia Dax, are really friends and really care about each other. And what I realized as I watched this scene is, if a show or a movie or a book or whatever can get me to believe its characters really care about each other, it's got me. There are certainly other examples of Deep Space Nine doing this in better episodes than Meridian, but it was watching Meridian that gave me the epiphany that made it clear to me what was happening and enabled me to articulate it. And you know, articulating how you feel about the thing you're reviewing and why you feel like that is an important thing for a critic to be able to do. It's kind of the entire job. So thanks, Meridian. You're not a great episode or even a good one, but you're okay by me. Those are my thoughts on Meridian. What do you think of this episode? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button, or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. Please join me next time as this batch of reviews dedicated to the worst episodes ever continues. Up next is Star Trek Voyager, and once again, as was the case with the TNG representative in this batch, the choice is obvious and unavoidable. It's the episode so bad, it actually dethroned Spock's brain as the default pick for worst episode ever of a Star Trek series. Next up, from Voyager's second season, I review Threshold. See you then. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.